Welcome to Rust News. It's been a while since my last post. A huge thank you to my sponsors. With the planning a wedding, getting married, selling houses, buying a house together, moving in with our combined eight kids. I've been busy. Time to get back to work though. I've got an important announcement regarding my online Rust courses and Arden Labs at the end of this video, but for now, let's talk about Rust 1.89.0, which was released on the 7th of August, 2025, thanks to the work of hundreds of contributors. What's interesting in this release? Number one, Rust now supports the underscore character as an argument to const generic parameters, inferring the value from the surrounding context. For example, this function takes a const generic parameter, len, and uses it to define a generic function over the length of the fixed array that it returns. You need to use the literal len in the function signature, but then in the function body, you can now use an underscore whenever you would have written out len. Number two, lifetime elision in function signatures is an ergonomic aspect of the Rust language, but it can also be a stumbling point for newcomers and experts alike. This is especially true when lifetimes are inferred in types where it isn't syntactically obvious that a lifetime is even present. Take this function, for example. The iterator over a slice that this function returns has the same lifetime as the slice it iterates over, but it isn't obvious from the return type of this signature that the return type even has a lifetime present. We know that the scores parameter has a lifetime because we know that all references have a lifetime. The other sure indication of a lifetime is a lifetime annotation that starts with an apostrophe, which Rust refers to as a tick, as in tick A for the most common named lifetime or tick underscore for alighting the name and letting the compiler figure out the lifetime name itself. Now there is a new lint that emits a warning like this, advising that if there are hidden lifetimes, you should add a tick underscore so that people can tell just by looking at your function signature that there is a lifetime present. While this is definitely more verbose, I like that this makes lifetimes more explicit when they are present, which should help you stay aware of lifetime issues when you're reading the code or dealing with compiler errors. Number three, more x86 target features. The target feature attribute now supports the cryptographic instructions for SHA-512, Xiaomi 3 and Xiaomi 4, key locker, and wide key locker. Additionally, a number of intrinsics for AVX-512, the advanced vector extension SIMD instructions, are also supported on x86, specifically these 18. So if you're into using x86 CPU features, there's a bunch more things to play with. Number four, doc tests can now be ignored on specific targets. For example, let's say you have a doc test that you know will crash if you run it on x86-64. Now you can add a ignore dash and the platform you want to ignore right after the triple backticks and doc tests won't be compiled on that target. Number five, I-128 and U-128 no longer trigger the improper C types definitions lint, meaning these types may be used in extern C functions without warning. This comes with some caveats. First, if C unsigned int 128 is available, then the Rust types are ABI compatible with the C types. Second, on platforms where int 128 is not available, the Rust types do not necessarily align with any C types. Finally, the Rust I128 type is not necessarily compatible with bit int 128 on any platform because bit int 128 and int 128 may not have the same ABI as is the case on x86-64. For more information, see the link in the description below to last year's blog post about the layout changes. Number six, the x86-64 Apple Darwin target, which is the target for macOS on Intel chips, has been demoted from tier one to tier two with host tools due to Apple's plans to discontinue support for that architecture. This means that tools like Rust-C and Cargo will be guaranteed to build, but not guaranteed to pass their automated test suites. This won't have any immediate impact, but over time, it's likely that reduced test coverage will lead to some breakage and incompatibility. Number seven, extern C functions on the Wasm32 unknown unknown target now have a standards compliant ABI. There's a whole separate blog post going over the details of this, but if you use something like Wasm bindgen, then you've already made the transition without 
without knowing it. If you deal with the low-level generated WebAssembly directly, then you should go check out the blog post link in the details below for more information on the changes. Number 8. There are two new Tier 3 targets, LungArch32 Unknown None and LungArch32 Unknown None Soft Float. LungArch is a Chinese target derived from MIPS and inspired in part by RISC-V. If you know what these 32-bit chips are used in, please make a comment below because I'm curious. Number 9. There have been a whole bunch of stabilized APIs in 1.89. We already talked about the x86 intrinsics. There's also non-zero over a care, the new file locking methods that depend on the operating system's file locking behavior, ways to create non-null pointers from references, some ways to deal with non-null pointer provenance, ways to leak the underlying slice of memory from an OS string or path buff, a method to flatten a nested result into just a single result, and some methods to enable, disable, or view the TCP quick hack option on Linux. Number 10, stabilized const APIs. The following previously stable APIs are now stable in const contexts. The method to get the mutable slice of an entire array, and the method to check if two slices are a case insensitive match in ASCII, both on an array of U8 and on a string slice. Now it's time to announce some changes to my online Rust courses. Up until now, I've mainly focused on publishing my courses on Udemy. This has changed. I'm no longer selling my Rust courses on Udemy, though those of you who have purchased it in the past should still have access to it. Instead, I've partnered with Arden Labs to host my courses there, and will be doing my live Rust training courses through Arden Labs as well. So if you're looking for my online courses, go check them out at Arden Labs, and if you're interested in getting some live training at your corporate event or conference or user group or whatever, you you can get that set up through Arden Labs as well. Links for all of that are below. There are links for all of that in the description below. What does the future hold for this YouTube channel? I'm not sure. My life has changed drastically over the course of the last two years. I don't have the free time to produce these videos for fun anymore, and my efforts to gain enough sponsors to make it a viable side hustle fell short. If I'm able to find a way to include producing more videos for this channel into my Rust teaching, I will. If you have any ideas for me, let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching, everyone.